Welcome to Missions Moment, the podcast of the Crop Project. This is episode number three. I'm Calvin. And I'm Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Today we want to talk about a project you've been working on a lot recently, and that is a short biography of the great man himself, Ludwig Krupp, whose name adorns our project. That's right. began at the beginning of April to write on his life and uh, finished it a few weeks ago. And it has also, just this past week, been submitted to a publishing house in Nairobi, East African um, educational publishers so we hope that they will pick that up and I'm thankful to Dr David Masilla for the foreword Dr Masilla is a gentleman I met in Nairobi last year uh, with my brother Stephen Kimetti he's the head the chairman of the National Museums of Kenya and he wrote the foreword for me so I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the publishers in Nairobi will pick it up it's also been submitted to a publishing house in in England, in UK here. Uh, so I'm waiting on word back from them also. Great. And as you've, you've written this book and spent time working through the story of Ludwig Krupp's life, uh, what's the main thing that you've noticed about him and the way he approached his life's work of missions? Well, he was born in 1810 uh, into a pietist home. But he wasn't converted until his mid-teens, and although his, the story of his conversion is still is not clear, uh, the fact that he was converted is clear because he went to the missionary society and they actually refused him at the beginning, not only because he was too young, he was about 15 at that time. He went back two years later and the chairman of the mission college was convinced that he had in that time become a believer and was showing evidence of that which is important. But throughout his life, and the very beginning of his biography, he wrote a biography, an autobiography, in German in 1858. It was printed in English, it was translated in English, and printed in London in 1860. And the first page of that uh, autobiography, he, he comes out very clearly to highlight the sovereignty of God in all of life, right? And and that comes out throughout the rest of his of his history. And even in the name that his father gave him, he was he was christened with the name Ludwig, which means wrestler. And he, he makes the point in the bio, in the autobiography that he was a good it was a good appellation for one who was to be a soldier of the cross. And then in early life he, he identifies, and I think it's in, important to, to notice this in his autobiography, he identifies a number of events that happen in his early teenage years that come together for his education. The first one was he got severely beaten by a neighbour for something that he didn't do. And he was confined to home for six months. He doesn't identify the injury. He didn't say what he was accused of doing, but he was confined to home. And during that time of confinement, he began to read devotional material, read the Old Testament. And he, he was particularly taken by the stories of the Old Testament. And he, he, beca- he began to learn them uh, in detail. Uh, another event which happened later on was his sister was going to the city uh, for an errand. And she knocked on the wrong door. And that uh, error was to bring her into connection with a widow of a vicar. And they got talking. And it turned out Ludwig Krupp, a young boy, was invited to to the city to go to school. This widow was going to pay for his schooling. So that, that event of his sister's error of knocking on the wrong door... And then when he went to school, the, the headmaster of the school said, well, what's your Latin like? And he had learned Latin during his time of confinement also. So when he went to learn the Latin, he later realized that that time of confinement for a beating that he had not, for something he had not yet not yet committed, uh, he recognized the providence of God in it all. Something similar happened to J.I. Packer, I believe. 
when he was a young boy, he was injured quite severely, uh, had a head, head injury or illness of some kind related to his, his head. And that was where he did so much of the learning that laid the foundation for a long and uh, very valuable career of writing and publishing good theology. And, and Krupp looked back at that period and said, this is, you know, there, was a, there was a reason for it. There was a purpose in it. Yeah. And he learned the Old Testament. When he came out of that time of confinement and joined the harvesters in the field and was telling them the events, the stories of the Old Testament, they could see there was something different. And, the, and many of them said, this young boy is going to be a preacher, right? So he looked back at that, those events coming together for the good of, of his life and the good of the Lord's work. And how did that theme of the sovereignty of God continue into his missionary work? Once he got the hold of the mission, his college years were fraught with difficulty in his self-identity. He struggled a lot, and, and I bring that out in the book. But when he got to, to Africa and Ethiopia and identified a particular people called the Oromo people, he called them the Gala at that time, they were known as the Gala. But he identified the Oromo people as the, as the key to the heart of Africa. And he, he, that locked in his mind to the point that he never let go of that. And he tried numerous ways. He was blocked many times from going into the southern part of Ethiopia to reach the Oromo people. He tried on the coast twice and then he went down the coast to another place and tried to get in. They were blocked him again. And to the to the point where he went back down through round the Horn of Africa and said, I'm going to get to them through Mombasa and come in at them from the south, right? So he had this idea of getting to the Romo that locked in his mind and he he never let go of that. So when his wife died then in 1844, um, when they when they arrived in Mombasa, uh, one of some of the most famous words he ever wrote, which have been often quoted in articles, when his wife died through the morning, he he wrote to a friend, and he said, "My heart and my body wept for many days, and yet in the midst of the, the grief." not only of losing his wife, but also a child, an infant child at the same time. He wrote, Tell the committee that in East Africa there is a lonely grave of one member of the mission connected with your society. This is an indication that you have begun the conflict in this part of the world. And since the conquests of the church are won over the graves of many of its members, you may be all the more assured that the time has come when you are called to work for the conversion of Africa. And they said this, Think not of the victims who in this glorious warfare may suffer or fall, only press forward until East and West Africa are united, are united in Christ. So this idea of getting through the heart of Africa to link West Africa with East Africa was his goal. His wife had died and he saw it as a stepping stone in the providence of God. It's interesting because so often the assumption is made that an appreciation of God's sovereignty and the certainty of his kingdom advance leads to a complacency among God's people for evangelism and discipleship. Mm -hmm. You know, God's going to take care of it, so he doesn't need me. But it's a good example of how it's pretty clearly the other way around that for, for Ludwig Krupp, as for so many other missionaries. And death again, when two other missionaries came out in the mid-1840s, uh, one man called Wagner, and he died just a few weeks after they arrived. He wrote to the committee uh, and saying that Wagner's very death has brought a blessing to the Midjikenda people. And although dead... He still speaks to them, for they have now, for the first time, seen the death and burial of a Christian whose joyful hope is in Christ, the life and the resurrection. Yeah, there you have it. Uh, good, good theology leads to good Christian living, leads to good missions, and right. in turn leads to good theology and good Christian living. Right. And uh, uh, it's really our prayer and hope that by working to strengthen the church in East Africa with good theology and the resources to continue preaching God's word in a 
bold and clear way that that will continue to produce godly Christian living, hope, courage, and uh, the strength for more mission work. And I have friends in, in Africa who are still working, pursuing unreached people. It's strange after 160 years or whatever of the gospel in Kenya that there still are unreached people. Yeah, so let's put that out for everyone listening. If you or someone that you know is able to contemplate serving the Lord in a foreign country, it's not uh, a need for the 19th century that's still needed today. And if you're not able to go yourself, uh, there are actually things that can be done without you leaving your home to serve the Lord for the sake of an unreached people group or a church uh, that's near those people. And maybe one of the best and simplest things that we can do is to invest in the strength and health and life of the church that's already there so that they would be able to conduct that ministry that maybe we won't have the opportunity to do ourselves. And not to give a plug for the Krupp project, but that's what we are intending to do is provide individuals in the West with the opportunity to help the church in Africa, though we may never go ourselves. We can, we can help the people who are there, the church there. And I think that's important to, to notice. And even, you know, I've met men who are ministering in places like Garissa, which are hotspots, Muslim hotspots and danger zones. They're, they're meeting in those places uh, and ministering in those places as missionaries in their own country. Well, thanks for the conversation, Aaron. It's good to talk about your book. We'll look forward to seeing it published, hopefully in Kenya and elsewhere. And we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Yep. Thank you, Calvin.